people on earth that knew it existed. So we've uh, now magnified that uh, a thousandfold. Sorry, can you, I forgot to start recording. So. Oh, you can record me. Thank you, sorry about that. All right, we're recording. So let me give you a little bit of background. Um, and before I get into this, I do want to plug Man Commissioning. So we are a commissioning firm in three different locations, EFW, Austin, and Houston. And we do um, traditional commissioning in the sense of new building. We actually do all the commissionings, new building commissioning, existing building commissioning. And in fact, we do the very special form continuous commissioning, which was pioneered by the Energy Systems Lab, um, which several of you should be aware of. And then my role is on a group that we call the Building Optimization Group. And you can go to our website, commandcx.com, and get a sense of uh, what we do, who we are. Um, it's spearheaded by the three of us, actually all three Aggies ourselves. And my role uh, is really on the, <clears throat> the modeling side, the technical expertise side. So any of the uh, optimization calculations, modeling, all of that runs through me. And we are always looking for talented individuals. And in fact, there are a few people who have had internships with us who first heard about us from a presentation just like this. So if you're interested, you can go to contact us and move this up, contact us careers, submit your information and we'll put it on file. Again, we offer, uh, we've done internships and we do have full-time positions as well. So if you think what I'm about to show is cool, maybe you'll think working with us is also cool. It's going to be weird. Maybe. So today, really want to cover two topics. One is NeoBAM, and the other is creating your own DSL or domain-specific language. And I have two goals with this presentation. One, that you know that this tool even exists. And two, that if I can do it, you can too. I want to give everyone here inspiration and confidence that you as an engineer, you don't need a computer science background. Um, compilers are not black magic. That if you are working in an area and think, wow, a real small little language would help me, that you're not afraid to go dive in. And that you kind of go through the journey with me how I went ahead and made NeoBank. So ideal prerequisites for the audience here would be you know what Energy Plus is, or you've done building energy simulations, and you have some programming experience. So let me just get a sense of what my audience is like here. How many of you have used Energy Plus? That's a good number. That's about half. I would assume all of you have programmed for as engineers? Yes. Python? Okay. So if I need to make comparisons, I think Python's a good reference that everyone should be able to kind of apples to apples compare. All right. This is meant to be better than Python for this particular domain. And that's what makes it a domain specific. So, and if that's not the case, that's okay. See the previous goals. I just want you to know this exists. And that you have inspiration and confidence that you could do this yourself. Okay. Again, we're not going to be able to be a master of NeoBAM programming by the end of this, but you should get a general sense of what it's all about. So what is NeoBAM? First, why, why is it called this? I, I went through lots of different names. Um, Neo is like a prefix for new or cool. Put Neo in front of anything makes it way better. And then BEM is short for Building Energy Modeling. Okay. I started off with things like IDF plus and play on C++ or something like this. But I really want to optimize. If you do a, a internet search, a DuckDuckGo or Google search for this, you won't find any results. So hopefully we can change that. Hopefully, you know, the actual homepage rises to the top. But uh, that's the name. It, uh, it really was heard out of, I had a child uh, 11 months ago. And when you have a young child, there are uh, early mornings. You're up at three o'clock in the morning and 
instead of watching Netflix, I think about compilers. That's uh, my wife thinks that's kind of crazy, uh, but that's really when a lot of this was uh, was written. Okay, she wanted to call it Dex, short for my son's name, but this is better. <laughs> All right, a bit of background about Energy Plus in particular. Energy Plus is a simulation engine, and it's very simple. It takes a text, very flat, simple text input file, churns it, and gives you back output data in text files, lots of files, in fact. And that's all it does. And that was the right decision by the people who originally worked on that project. They shouldn't have been in the business of fancy graphical interfaces or wrapper programs. They needed to focus on the engine and the engine alone. It took the industry a little bit to build that surrounding tooling. And even today, it's not the greatest environment. Partially why I had to <laughs> write my own programming language for it. Um, but it's, it's really good that it's designed this way. It's uh, very modular. So anybody can, as long as you can write a simple text file, you can make these input files. And they really are very simple. They are simply an object type or a class type identifier, and then all the fields that go with it. So object type could be chiller, and then the first field would be the name, the tonnage, uh, the curve values. <clears throat> and it's comma separated, semicolon delimited, and that's, and that's it. And so I'll show you, um, if I, I pulled up just an example file here in Notepad, just to prove to you there's no, like these are simple text files. So I'm gonna be using uh, a terminal emulator in a bit, but I want you to be aware you can use any text editor of your choice whether that's Notepad, Visual Studio Code. There's tons of Notepad++, things like this. But <clears throat> like this one in the middle here is saying I have, this is a, a curve that's representing my efficiency as a function of temperature, condenser water temperature or chill water supply temperature. It's got a name and it's got all these coefficients, et cetera. Very simple. So to run Energy Plus, all you have to do is just have the right stuff. You have to have the right objects. And I, I say that this is analogous to assembly language. Right? Assembly language for a CPU is the root instructions that it understands. There's not a whole lot that goes on and you can use it as a target for other languages. Okay. So normally, I do not recommend that if you're interested in Energy Plus modeling, that you fire up Notepad and you just start typing away one object at a time. There are better ways than that. So there are existing solutions out there. Like I said, people do not just type these in, in Notepad. Um, the one that comes out of the box, if you install Energy Plus is called the IDF editor for editing IDF files. <clears throat> there is Open Studio, which is perhaps the best alternative and an alternative that I do recommend for many people. There's other solutions that are less note well known. There's E plus R, there's Epi, there's Model Kit, and fill in the blank, write it in your favorite X language. But all of these have issues. So with the IDF editor, it's essentially a glorified spreadsheet with some error checking and some completion with dropdowns. Okay? So you don't have any functions, you don't have any variables. So if you want to make large changes or you want to parameterize your model, you really can't do that. Open Studio is a graphical user interface wrapper around Energy Plus, and it's good, point and click, do things real fast, you can reuse lots of things, but you are giving up some level of control with that. Okay, so you can't perfectly parameterize. You're still at the whim of what they expose to you. And so for me as a software developer, I just can't deal. Okay. The other uh, options, E plus R, I don't know R, I don't want to learn R. Uh, Epi, 
Again, I don't want to use Python. I don't want to go through the hassle of having a full Anaconda in installation to write some, some lines of text. That's just way overkill. Uh, model kit is made by um, um, Big Ladder Software out of Denver, which makes lots of tooling for MG+. Plus. It's Ruby. I don't like Ruby. Okay. And if you have any other language, what you're going to have is a death by print statements. Okay. When you write strings to a file, you typically got everything's got to be quoted. Everything has to be print to screen. I have to do a bunch of file I.O. I, I have all these things that make things more complicated than they need to be. So none of these worked for me. So I just took it upon myself. I'm going to write my own from the ground up. It can be literally the exact syntax that I want. So to just show a little bit of what I mean by this like IDF editor, this is how if you were to take um, the Energy Plus course here, you would at least start, start with this. So you have a list of all the objects that you can possibly make on the left hand side. I can click new object and I can type stuff in 10.3. If I need to put a building, let me add a building. I add that, I can give it a name. But I hope you can see when you build a large scale energy simulation model, you are going to have thousands of objects. Every wall, every window, every floor needs to be entered in here. And, and so if, you, if I want to say I need 50 zones all separated by 10 meters or something like this, you're going to be typing it in by hand or you're using some other tool to help you along with that. <clears throat> All right, so you sit down and you start thinking about what, if I'm gonna design this from, the, from scratch, what do I want it to be like? What are my goals for this? So number one is I wanted it to be a superset of an IDF file. If you just give me a raw IDF file, I want it to work. It should be exactly the same. So that's what this is. So if you have an IDF file, like all the example files that come from Energy Plus, you can just use that. That is valid NeoBAM programming code. And the way it gets around this is it's not technically a perfect superset because I hinge off the fact that usually the first letter in the object name is a capital letter. Okay. And if you follow that convention, then it is a strict superset and everything works. Okay. Energy Plus is case insensitive. When it runs the simulation, it actually goes through a process of upcasing everything, which is kind of annoying because it's really hard to read. Everything shows up all uppercase, like it's screaming at you, all the errors, right? Wall one, bad. You know? So you take advantage of that. I wanted it to be conceptually simple. Okay. What I mean is I don't want classes. I don't want static typing. I don't want all this stuff that general programming languages need to handle complexity for complexity that I don't have, right? I just need a way to generate very simple comma delimited text files. So I don't need all this other noise. I also wanted it to be aesthetically pleasing to read. You typically read code more than you write code. The next time I come to this, I want this to look good. I want this to be clean, not a ton of not a ton of curly braces everywhere, a bunch of keywords that don't need to be there. I want it to look good. And you'll see some of the, the outcomes of that design goal. Cross-platform. So uh, I wrote this in um, C sharp and it allows me to build this for Windows, Li uh, Macs, Linux, your favorite system. So if you have a computer, this should run. Okay. Wanted this to be accessible to to everybody. So what is NeoBAM? It's a programming language that was designed to expressively parameterize an Energy Plus model. Okay. I want to be able to put in the minimum amount of data and get out my model deriving anything in between that I had to. It's a corresponding compiler, or some people might say transpiler because I'm not going to machine code as my target language. And it's a corresponding formatter. 
So remember what I was talking about, it's aesthetically pleasing to read. Another thing I've built alongside this is a built-in formatter. So you never have to worry about formatting your code. There is a de facto standard that I have written, what I think is the ideal way it should look, and it does it for you automatically. So you have what it is. What else is important is what it is not. It's not a graphical user interface as of now, all right? It's a programming language that you write and then you compile it and you get an IDF file as your output. This doesn't do parametric runs. It's not a uh, output analyzer. It's again, simply something to help you create your models and just meant to be a tool in the tool set. It's not a linter, so it's not gonna tell you what's wrong or fix uh, errors in your model. And it most definitely is not a solution to all of your energy modeling problems that you've ever come across. Okay? That's my disclaimer. Okay? But I still think it's pretty cool. So it has simple functional syntax, no classes, no inheritance, no static typing. It has very straightforward data loading. So I wanted to be able to, a lot of times I have data that are in the form of mechanical schedules from a drawing set or it's from a um, GBXML file or a JSON file or any sort of these standard data files that you would get that have information about my pieces of equipment. I wanna be able to just simply say, load type Excel, give me the path, boom, I have the data. And I'll show you an example of that. Simple importing. You all said you worked with Python, right? How many of you have had zero issues with packaging or finding the right import statement? No hands, right? right? Am I using PIP3 versus PIP? Did I have an Anaconda installation versus the, the one that I got from my package manager? I have had it up to here with Python packaging and import statements, right? Here, you say import and the file you want, right? There is no search path. There is no sys.path.insert. You point me to the file. If you want to search for it, you write a function for it, but it's very explicit. What also is important is that unlike those languages, you can actually just import from the web. Don't even have to have the file on your system. Okay? There's no security concerns here because there is no file IO. It's uh, NeoBAM can't write to your disk. It's not gonna execute anything. All it can do is just print text to the standard output. So no matter whatever nefarious things someone tried to trick you into, it's not gonna work. Okay? But this is incredibly useful because now there is no downloading. I don't have to have anything. I could just walk up to any machine and run this and it'll pull all its dependencies down. So you can imagine instead of PIP or something where you have a very centralized store, this is completely distributed. Anyone can put any of these files on the internet and I could load them up. Okay. So the way I imagine this to start is I'm trying to build a bit of a small library on GitHub and you can just pull those in straight from there. So some of the unique language features that I think are very different and are you know, things that are very experimental. We have something called inline data tables, which I will show. The importing from URL, which I was just talking about. Part of the aesthetic appeal is that I, I try to go outside the realm of simple ASCII characters. So I use Lambda symbols, I use check marks, I use uh, other characters that look good. Now you don't have to type them that way. The formatter will take your scratch code and make it look good. Okay? That's a big, the big difference. And then to do is direct integration of the BCL, the building component library, which is a library of information that NREL has put out of snippets of IDF files, which all have unique identifiers, which is, are great because now I can point to that. And if I have this ID, everyone knows that Okay, that's a known thing that's been vetted. Like that is a good chiller model. It didn't just come from me. And you can also just very easily pull these things in. Okay, so at this point, I'm going into the dangerous part of the, thing, the talk because I'm gonna start doing some live programming and compiling. So hopefully, wish me luck that there are no, you know, terrible compiler errors that you know, are showstoppers. I have some backup slides if things you know, really go haywire. 
Any questions? I guess this is a good time to just kind of pause, reflect, before we get into the meat and the potatoes of this. All right, let's, let's dive in on my makeshift uh, workstation that we have here. All right, so let me, how did I? Control, Alt, Shift, H. So first a bit about like, where, where can you get this? Okay, this is open source software, free for anybody to use and pull down. Right now I have it on my GitHub account. So you can just search Mitch Paul slash NeoBem. You'll see all the code here. Um, and the installation process is very straightforward. You download the release, the zip file, and then you make sure that that executable is on your path and then run it. You can run it in command prompt. You can run it in PowerShell. You can run it in any sort of shell environment. There is also the NeoBem documentation page. Ah, look at this. Not every piece of open source software actually takes the time and care to actually write some of this out. And all of you in the audience are in a very lucky place because you now actually know the author. You can contact me personally, okay? Which I would love, all right? So again, this is meant to be, uh, you know, the first ones, this is alpha base, you know, alpha level software, but I still think it's very useful. <clears throat> So I'm going to fire up my uh, terminal emulator here, and I'm going to program on the left side of the screen, and you should see the compiled output on the right-hand side of the screen. So I have this file. I call it in.nbem is the standard extension. File type neobem. Over here, I have the compiled in.idf, again, which should just be very simple comma delimited semicolon stuff over here. All right, don't bother with the rest of it. It's 58 degrees and part of the cloud. Yeah. <clears throat> so the simplest thing that we can do in here is literally have IDF syntax, All right? So I'm going to be doing very simple objects here. So I can say version 9.4, I'm going to compile that. I get out version 9.4. Okay. But that's a big deal because there are no strings, there are no print statements. I just use the syntax directly and it works. Okay, very clean. So <clears throat> now we can do very simple things like a variable assignment. I just want maybe I want to say 9.4 is a variable that I may want to change in the future. So I can say something like my version equals. 9.4, and just to prove to you that expressions actually work, I'm going to add one to it. And in the objects for the IDF, you can use replacements. So you put them in little angle brackets, and I'm going to say my version. Put that in there. Now I compile it, and I should get version 10.4 on the right hand side. All right? Cool. We have comments, but what's interesting is that you actually have two flavors of comments. Okay? There are actual comments in the IDF file. And if you actually read through any IDF file, the very prototypical thing to do is every field is on its own line and a description of what is it, that field is to the right. So it's very important that that kind of carries over. So comments in IDF files have exclamation points. So I could say this is a version num, but you also may want to comment your file that doesn't get compiled. That's like a traditional programming language comment. So you can use the pound sign for that. So this is my comment that won't show up. So I'm going to compile that. And now you see version 10.4 and version number over to the side. All right, let's start doing some more fancy things. So variable assignments, super cool because there's a lot of repeated text, right? I'll say, um, like I give a wall, wall one blank, wall one this, or chiller one this, chiller one curve, chiller one whatever. If I want to rename chiller one to something else, I want to change up the variable. 
But a lot of times, the next most important thing besides assignment and just very simple algebraic expressions, which we have, we got all of them. So I'm not going to show you multiply and divide. Just trust me, they're there. Okay. Would be function statements. Okay. So as I said, as I mentioned, this is a functional style language. So everything here is an expression. A function statement is an expression, and I can pass around functions as if they were a number. So you can do lots of real cool things. So let's say my function is called add one and you put in all your parameters <laughs> as names. And then I can say num plus num. Well, let's, let's say num plus two, just so it's different than this. Something like that. Add two. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm assigning a function so a function has either a, a backslash. I have some keyboard shortcuts to help me put in some characters, but this is also valid syntax. I put a backslash. That starts a function definition. I put parameter one, two, whatever, and then I put the expression that it goes to. So num goes to num plus two. And so down here, I can change this to add two, and we can put in my version. So now I got to do a little bit of math. We should get 10.4. Make sense? We had 9.4 plus one, and then I'm throwing in add two of that. 12.4. Cool. <clears throat> What's interesting about these functions, though, is that they also serve as the templating engine. So instead of having the version thing kind of hanging out here at the root level of this file, I can wrap this up into something called my version template. When you give me the number, and I'm going to, in this function body, I'm going to put version, and then I'm going to call that, that num. And I'm going to put a comment here, just so you know it came from here. And now instead of this, I'm going to go print version template of 8.5. I'm going to compile that. Of course, I just had a syntax error because I didn't terminate my object. And now I have that over here, okay? Super clean, right? I didn't write a, a def statement and then pass in a parameter and then print line one, print two, print whatever. It's just literally the expressions. No more, no less. <clears throat> um, just to show you what I mean about it being functional, I could say, This might blow some of you away who have not ever kind of worked in this environment when a function returns a function. So I'm going to call this function get add a number, takes a number, and then what it returns is another function that's going to add these two together. Right. And now I can say my instance is get add a number and we'll say it's five and then new version is equal to my instance of three. Right. So get add a number, return a function. I store it to a variable and now I'm using that variable and I'm calling a function. And so if I take this out and I say new version, this should, if all things go well, give me eight. Okay. Now, if you work in a functional language paradigm, like a Haskell or something like that, it takes this idea all the way down. Everything's a function. And if you take a computer science course, you'd know that basically anything computable is possible at that point. Right? So 
with just these simple constructs, you can pretty much do anything you could ever imagine. Now, certain things will be quite difficult for you. Uh, this is not optimized to be fast. So please don't be throwing like 10,000 item arrays at this or doing general machine learning or something. That's not what this is for. Okay? This is a DSL, domain specific language, to go from there to here. That's all it is. But... <clears throat> all right. So let me check. All right, so we covered variables, functions, comments. All right, let's talk about inline data tables. So again, a lot of times what I wanna do in my models is I'm, I have data and I just wanna map that data to what I need for my input files. I have a mechanical schedule. It tells me air handler, tells me horsepower, it tells me whatever. I just need to map that data set over to objects. And in a lot of languages, that entry of data can be very verbose. If I'm in certain languages that are statically typed, when I want a list, I gotta go list of strings, my list equals new list of strings, scurly brace, whatever, right? I wanted it to be better than that. So we can do something that I call inline data tables. And if anyone's written Markdown, it's heavily inspired by that. So I can say a choose, and I'm gonna just make this table. I'm gonna say a choose have a name. Actually, let's, let's do zones. Zones have a name and they have an X origin and other stuff. I'm gonna separate the header. I'm gonna say zone one and zero zone two, and okay. close this guy up. And what that is now is a structure. It's gonna be a, the expression, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an expression. So this evaluates to something. And it evaluates to a list of structures. And so <clears throat> this is exactly the same. I, have, I should show structures as well. So. You can have what's called an associative array or a dictionary that's in most languages. So I could say you know, HU1 has name zone one and X origin is zero. Okay. I think people, if you've programmed, you should have seen syntax that looks like this before. Okay. But <clears throat> Essentially, zones is a list of those things. But it's when you have a 2D array, a 2D table, right? It makes sense from a spatial point of view to put it in a table. Right? If I look at a typical JSON file, most of the text in there is just repeated uh, keys for the different fields when I have a big list, right? And so you can, if you put it in a 2D grid, it's much more efficient. Now, that table looks kind of janky. Uh, so NeoBAM comes with a formatter, right? So I just formatted this and now it uses box drawing characters to make this table look absolute pretty. So the next time I come in this file, I'm just, I just look at the table and it looks really nice. I can see zone one and is this, whatever else. So now the very protocol, the, the typical thing I now do is I take this data and I map it over a template. Uh, I would do something like zone template equals zone. And I don't think I have a snippet here ready. I'm going to say the first field is always the uh, zone name. So I'm going to say zone. If I want to get at a parameter, I do a period and then a string. And it actually can be a very, like that can express, that can be a variable. So if I had something that was name as a string, I can get it, but keep it simple. So this is name and then zone, zone dot X origin. And now a, a true zone item has a bunch of other stuff, but I don't want to, I don't want to get you confused in the noise here, right? So 
So now I'm going to print and I'm going to go, I can do it two different ways. I'm going to do a map operation. I'm mapping data over a template. So there's a special operator. You can either say map, uh, list and function, or I can say something like zones, type equals zone template. And that should work. So let me, that should work. All right, compile. Now I have zone one, zone two. Okay. So I took this data and I gave it a template and I mapped it over. And you can think of it the way I think of it is, right? If I had a list and I had an array stacked vertically and I do a map function, I'm taking each item one to one horizontally and transforming it in some manner. You can also do a big part of these things is I have a list. I may want to filter that list. So there's a built-in filter. So say I only want uh, I only want zones in which the X origin is greater than five. Okay, so zone dot X origin is greater than five. So this should only give me one. Now I only get 10. So that's a big concept. So it's data definition, and then it's filtering, mapping, and putting that to the output. <clears throat> so just to you know be facetious here, we also have a lot of times you just need like n number of things. I want 10 zones and I want them all spaced equally apart. There's a range operator. I can say zone nums equals one, one to 10. So that's giving me a list of integers, one to 10. And then I could say print uh, zone nums. I need to map it to something, take a num. Let's just let's just keep it simple. I'm gonna say versions. Okay. I'm gonna go print um, versions. I'm gonna map that. We do have a version template, right? Version template. said I didn't give it a list because you need two periods for a range operator. Come on, guys. You didn't catch me on a language you don't I've never heard of? There, now I have 10 versions. Okay. So range operator, pretty cool. All right, let's talk about importing from Excel. So say I have data in Excel, and it can even have formulas and stuff, but like I need to take this and I need to turn it into an IDF file. <clears throat> so I have this Excel file. It has new sheet, and it says name, X origin, zone 345. <clears throat> uh, let me go to a new window here. Because I don't want to type it out to save some time. This is in the way again. Okay. This is this all. This is all it takes. All right. So I say data is load type Excel because you can have it supports JSON and XML as well. Give it the path to the file. I say the range starts at I six is on this sheet. I give it my template name X Y origin, and then I print map over the data. And if I were to compile this. File should go through. And I look at the IDF file. Now I get all the zones. These are this is what the true zone object looks like. So I see zone three, four, and you can see these were the X origins that I had in my Excel file. Right. So imagine now instead of SketchUp for geometry, I go in Excel and I parameterize and I get the coordinates all 
just the way I want. And now I'll just load template on my way. <clears throat> Import from web. Import from web is what it sounds like. Okay. So you can do import statements. So at a minimum, for example, say I just want to use the um, default files that come from Energy Plus for like chillers, and I just want to load that in. You just do import that, and it's as if you typed it in yourself. Okay. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but the joy it brings me to not have packaging issues just <laughs> it can't be understated. Okay. Just be explicit. I just want to bring my own Python file into this thing and not have to package it up or all this. None of that's nonsense. I point it to what you want and you get that. All right. So just let's see if I do a format. So I just did a, a format command on here. So this is kind of what this is what at least I think this file should look like when it's formatted. But it takes all that bike shedding about, you know, what spaces or non-spaces, whatever, there, this is the de facto standard and you don't have to worry about it. But what it also does, again, is it transforms your tables to look what I think really nice. It's going to turn backslashes into lambda symbols. It's going to turn trues <laughs> into check marks. All these things that make it very pleasant to read. Through. All right, so it's 6.52, so I need to stop rambling on about this, but that I hope gives you the general sense. You can go to the reference manual and it has everything in here and I am available to help. So, all right, so let's, let's quickly go to, let's just see if there's, again, if you were doing it in Python, I just want to throw an example, like everything in Python would be print F, new lines everywhere, not fun. So we have, I thought, well, I didn't go over it. You can, there are lists, right? You can type in a list manually. I talk about associative arrays, booleans. All right. Take a breath, right? So that's over. So I don't expect you all to know how to use it or even how to install it yet, but I want you to know that it exists. And if it interests you, that you should give it a try. Now I come to the inspiration phase, right? How in the world, I'm a mechanical engineer by trade. Okay? Yes, I had 10 years of program experience before this, but you know, it's something I think everyone should feel is possible. Right? In a language, if you are a programming language designer, there are three big phases. There's lexing, there's parsing, and code generation. Right? If you are a computer science major, You'd be doing homework example problems where you'd write your own lexer, your own parser. You talk about reverse <clears throat> recursive descent parsers, LALR parsers. You start searching these terms, it gets kind of scary, right? You can skip to the good parts, all right? There are tools available that are called either compiler compilers or parser generators. You can do a search for them, there are lots of them. But essentially what they do is you describe your language and the grammar, very simple, and it, it will generate the source code for the lexer and the parser for you. So you don't ever have to worry about that. So what I had used on this, this project is a tool called Antler, which is a um, reverse acronym, another tool for language recognition okay? done by a guy named Terrence Parr at the University of San Francisco. I am deeply deeply indebted to him. If he watches this, thank you. Um, awesome tool. Okay. I'll show you a bit of what the syntax looks like of how I describe this language that then turns into the final product. But there are other ones. The classics, if you are a C programmer, is called Bison and Yak. In Haskell, there's Alex. There's a new thing called Tree Sitter, which GitHub uses for all its syntax highlighting. Very cool. Go to Wikipedia page for parser, parser generators, and you'll see a list of hundreds of these. But I, from personal experience, can recommend Antler. So this is just a snippet of what, when I design this language, what that looks like. So you have the idea of these, uh, these uppercase things here are tokens. And then I'm describing it in a syntax that's called regular expressions. 
what that means. So a Boolean literal true is either the string true or it's a check mark. False is false or this. An identifier for all my variables are a lowercase letter followed by other alphanumerics at sign underscore as many as you want. A comment is an exclamation point followed by other stuff. Neobam comment is a pound sign. So I'm not gonna, again, explain every detail of this, but I want to just scroll through. This is the actual source code. So if I go through the, the Lexer, these are all of the tokens that I defined. I'm just saying what they are, right? This is the less than sign, not equal to map operator, pipe operator, import statements. Um, then we get to the inline data table, which I described. Uh, new barracks, whatever. That's all the tokens. So what is it? It's 109 lines of code. It's not even lines of code. It's just a data description of my language. That's the lexer and then the parser. This is the big statement. All right. This is what an, an expression is. An expression is either expression member access expression. You have multiplying and dividing plus and or and precedent is just set by how high it is up in this list. So if you were to write your own parser or your own stuff, you have to deal with this really difficult problem called left recursion, where this is called a production. So an expression can turn into this. When you have expression as your first token or your first item, that's really bad, okay? But Antler just magically makes that all disappear. All right, so most languages have the concept of an algebraic expression, this plus this, this times this. And so again, that's all you have to be entering. If I go down, see some other things. Uh, that structure is just, again, a left curly followed by some property depths, whatever. And it generates all the code I need to parse that. And then I'm just uh, going through and, and using it. So if I can, See if I can. Uh, I just want to show. Oh boy. Oh. All right, she did. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's about seven. I'll, I'll boot this back up for extra questions. But um, what was it? I just lost my train of thought now. This thing, of course, gives you like a two second warning. You know? um, anyways, it produces source code. And then essentially, you just write what's called a parse tree walker or visitor. So then it gives you all these methods, which would say, like, uh, enter variable statement. And then it gives you the context of what was in that. And then typically, your code will just write that to a dictionary or whatever. You parse the file, and then you are just that's where I am doing the print statement, death by print statements. I'm doing that in C sharp, all right? And then it's printing all this stuff out. Um, so again, the compiler black magic, it's all taken away from you. You can use a parser generator. And again, you can, these little languages can make life much more delightful in your very specific niche world that you might find yourself in, again. There's the subset of general programming languages, mechanical engineers who write energy plus files, people like me who are programmers, people like me who are ex obsessively compulsive enough that they'd write their own language, right? But it's great. And so I hope if any of you um, are doing this kind of work that you uh, so. Uh, the last there, I do want to bring it back up. At least the one thing I want to say is if you are interested in using it and you come into problems, you should go to unmethours.com and tag your question Neobam. And I have a watch on that, so it should come to my email box. And I, I promise to you, I will try to answer every single question that comes that way. Or you go to GitHub, there's a discussions tab on GitHub. And there's like a, you can, there's four different sections. There's like Q and A, there's feature requests. I'm looking for input and any sort of uh, commentary around it. And if you actually do find a bug, which there are, um, you can make an issue on GitHub itself. So those are the main ways that hopefully you guys can contribute if you're interested. But if not, I have an audience of one that really likes it. So with that, I'm done. So thank you guys.
questions? Yes. Yes. How long did it take to write this? It was, again, started when my son was born, which was December 10th. Um, written on nights and weekends uh, here and there. Um, I don't know, 40, 50 hours or so. Um, it wasn't small, right? And then I, I went to the effort of all the, uh, the documentation and trying to do all that right and all the testing. Um, so that, that also took some time to, to come up with, but um, not an obscene amount of time. I did it outside my day job. So um, if, I had, if I had just a whole week or if I was a, you know, a graduate student with all the academic freedom in the world to sit down and explore, you know, it's not, it's not unfeasible to, to go ahead and do it. So Luke is asking, uh, have there have there been any issues with the input of building geometry that are that's like typically seen in SketchUp? Um, not exactly sure what that question means. So, like, if there are issues with your model, that's your fault because it, you typed in things wrong. Like again, this is not going to find runtime errors in your Energy Plus model. So, if there are compiler errors, that's one thing. It'll let you know. Okay, you put in wrong syntax, but if you, it, it will totally take a invalid object. So you forgot a field or something like that. It's not going to catch those types of things. But the idea is you don't worry about that so much because you abstract all the, that away and you're just typing it. You have a function or a template that's taking one value and it's spitting you back a perfectly formatted or perfectly done object. So you try to kind of avoid that. How much time do you think it saved you? Um, again, for save compared to what baseline? It's compared to doing Open Studio or something, actually dragging. So the stuff. first pilot of this was my own house. So if you're a software guy, they call it dog fooding your own stuff, right? So I wanted to put it to the test. So I actually wrote an Energy Plus model of my house, which I had an example of. If I could pull this back up. Um, and it was really nice, honestly, because it just, well, it's exactly what I designed it to be. <laughs> so Luke had a follow-up question. Um, mm -hmm. How automated is the import for the data from the mechanical schedules? Is this an import direct from PDFs, or is this a retyped Excel file import? It would, you would have to have it in, in some sort of data file. So if you had a PDF, you would either have to extract that via Tabula, great tool for extracting tables out of PDF. Um, actually, so let me, this is, this is a, a home models. I have my baseline model of my house. I'll just kind of scroll through this. This is a whole, this is a start to finish, fully finished program. So I have some, <clears throat> the normal stuff you need, outputs, some window constructions. I have some conversions. We'll get to the good stuff. You want to know? Here's all the zones in my house. I just dox myself on, you know, on YouTube. I have two units: AC1, AC2. I have aptly named them. Uh, some windows. These are all my zone coordinates, right? So for me, like it's a, I, I make it easy. I live in a one-story ranch house. So once I know the coordinates, right? I have the four coordinates for my thing. I can derive what all the walls are, right? I, I just know I go from this coordinate to this coordinate. I know a height. All that stuff is all derived. So all I just have is a list of coordinates here, and whether it's an interior or exterior wall. Um, let's see. There's a bunch of helper functions, walls, laundry walls. This is my zone template. All right, so I pass it a zone, and then you got to make a zone. You got to make the equipment connections. If anyone's done Energy Plus, you know how verbose this gets. It's terrible. You don't escape from that. Here's my air loop. You see all the variables. Anyways, it comes out to 802 lines of code. I don't have, let's see. If I, oh, this isn't going to compile because I don't have that file on my computer. Anyways, it's several thousand lines when you, com when you compile it out. Okay, so it's saving quite a bit. Let me just see if there are anything. I'll just quickly run through. 
Oh, these are all the, if you want to use Antler, you can use any of these languages to do it. All right. So most of you know Python, so it has a Python part. In it. This is an actual tree from one of our, our things. This is an example of how you would visit it. Oh, if it's an existing style, say I want to transpile some existing known language, you go to this GitHub site, people have already written all the grammars for like a bazillion known languages. So if I need to take another file and compile it, I want to get the source tree of that. Um, what's next? BCL, maybe do 2 I don't really do it. Last one, fix all bugs, sad face. Um, yeah, that's it. Again, I'm at hours tag NeoBem, go to my the GitHub page, use the discussion tabs, whatever else. Ryan has my contact information. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? And I'll be, I'm going to stick around. So if there's a more, like you want a more detailed question, just come up and ask me after. I'll even you do more live demos or anything you want to see. So yeah, I guess I'll stop the recording here. Um, and like Mitch said, if anyone else has any more detailed questions, you can ask him. And if there's more pizza, please take more pizza. Please eat that. Please eat pizza. <laughs> and I think Dr. Rasmussen left us those cookies too. So if you want a few cookies, feel free to have those. So. Thank you. Thank you.